And now we come to that time in our service when we're given pause to consider what is deepest in our hearts or most profoundly on our minds or in the work of our hands. In the days that have transpired or in the prospect of days to come, joys and sorrows which touch us deeply and are given another measure of meaning because of our capacity to share them in the midst of a company that claims us as a cojourner. So I invite those of you who have joys or sorrows this day to come forward and form lines on either side of the sanctuary, to come and speak briefly into the microphone, telling us first who you are so that those using our auditory enhancement devices might also participate in this important ritual, and then to light a candle if you so desire. And for those of you who are joining us online this morning, I welcome your participation in this important ritual by placing a joy or sorrow in the chat which will be shared by our technology team. Are there joys or sorrows to be shared this day? I'm, Sh I'm Cheryl Lachey. I was born at St. Francis Hospital in Tulsa, Oklahoma. My brother did his internship there to become a doctor as part of his training to become a doctor and left his practice there about 15 years ago to do different um, places, ad tenems, and enjoy the world. I am wearing the only thing I have that's pretty enough that has orange in it. I invite everyone who is needing to make it known that we have too easy access to firearms to join me in wearing orange every time you get a chance. Thank you. Hi, my name is Rachel Wagner, and um, one of the things that I do in my life is I'm a teacher um, at the school next door at Bancroft. And um, last year was such a strange year, teaching. And, and learning happened in so many different um, unusual and uncomfortable ways. But we knew as teachers and as a community that last year was going to be really strange and that we just needed to buckle up and hold on. Um, and we also knew going into this year that this year was going to perhaps be more difficult for us because it looks like regular school, but it's not because we're still in a pandemic, and we have students and faculty who have been touched by, um, by tragedy and by trauma and by um, the stress of the unusualness of our experience. So as we're coming to the end of our school year, um, if you have a teacher in your life that um, either of your children or your grandchildren or someone that you know um, that you're appreciative of, please let them know. Thank you. Hi, my name's Deidre. I'm not going to remove my mask, but that's okay. <laughs> I was reading the name. Um, this year, I have homeschooled my kids. It's a bit of a joy that it is now over. <laughs> um, my oldest was diagnosed with ADHD and autism, so it's been a uh, weird ride. <laughs> and I definitely appreciate all of his teachers that have helped him. Um, but to brag, I actually increased his scores so much that they reduced some of his services. And um, my youngest, who you see running around here, being the little fundraiser that he is, um, just loves coming to this church and that we are so thankful that we could come back. So, thank you. Hi, I'm, I'm Debbie Merrill, and um, I have two things that I'm really concerned about. Um, the lack uh, and I, I've spoken about my mother who lives in Florida, and um, she was doing great until a couple of months ago, and um, she has uh, developed a, a depression and level of anxiety and panic attacks that I've never seen in her before. 
and I think a lot of it has to do with the, um, the concerns of aging. Um, she's 84, and uh, she has all of the existential dreads that um, come sometimes with aging, and they've really, really overwhelmed her, um, and it's, it's uh, difficult for me uh, as well to see her like this. Um, and then the second is, um, it, and it kind of piggybacks on, on Rachel's comment, I, I too am in education, I'm at Clark University, and I have seen a level of um, animosity and tension and um, uh, disrespect of others that I've never seen there before in, in 30 years. Um, I have always said that the Clark students are the nicest people I know. Um, and I'm fortunate, I don't feel that way anymore. And that's really hard. It's really hard to go to work um, and feel that way about the people that you're trying to, to teach. Um, thank you. Hi everyone, I'm Melissa. Um, as some of you know, I come from a huge extended family. I, I once had 18 aunts. I now have two left, and no uncles left. Um, one on each side of the family is left, both of my aunts. And one of them I visited yesterday for what might be the last time I get to see her. And um, I, I was reminded of so many things while I visited with her about how much I value her and how, how wonderful she's been in our family. And she told some stories that made me also value this community a lot more. Um, she was not a Roman Catholic and she married into a very Roman Catholic family. And some branches of my family accepted her and some did not, to the point of not even inviting her to any family occasions because she wasn't Catholic enough. Um, and uh, because she was sending her children to church, but she wasn't going herself, that was their problem. And um, she got across to me yesterday as best she could that she appreciated the fact that our my branch of the family was happy to have her in our family and I really have been happy to have her. She's a, she's a pistol. So um, I hope that yesterday wasn't the last time I get to see her, but it, it, it may have been. So if you could keep her family in your thoughts, thanks. morning. My name is Paul, and um, I had the opportunity to attend the, um, um, it was a celebration because of the, uh, the Black History Month in Worcester, Black History Trail. Uh, it was started at the Elm Park School over in John Street in North Ashland. And it was interesting because that was the community that I grew up in. I grew up on 32 John Street, and, and as uh, Ed uh, Robinson was there, and I was telling him, I'll show him all the places, and and it was funny that, um, you know, growing up there, and I knew the, the area very well, and I said, well, Ormond Street used to go all the way to John Street, and somebody kicked in, no, it never did. <laughs> you weren't here in the 60s, please, and believe me, I was here. But it was, it was, um, it was interesting to see the, the houses that I visited how the people that were there that were very influential in the uh, in the black history. Um, I guess one of the women you may know on the, on the Jeffersons, the grandmother, okay, was um, she grew up on John Street, you know, and uh, I said, wow. <laughs> and so it was really a, a really uh, a nice thing, and also to reminisce. And I ran into people that knew my family, and it says, um, and it was. Uh, it was kind of like old home week, but none of my the people that I grew up with, my friends, that because everybody was out, I was out of the area too, and um, so it was um, it was just a great time to uh, to experience and enjoy the uh, and appreciate you know the uh, the history. My name is Kim Navaglioni. 
I ask for prayers for my sisters, in-laws, family, Lori, Jamie, Alexa, Sean, and Patrick as they are all going through mental and physical um, health issues. I also came up as a teacher because our students are struggling. I've been a substitute teacher for the last year and a half, and so I've been in every single classroom of the school, 530 kids, and the teachers are struggling, and the students are struggling, and it's really, really hard for all of us. Um, I know kids that just don't want to go home. I have had so many kids come up and ask me if they can have a hug or hold my hand, more so this year than ever before. Please keep your, in your thoughts and thoughts and prayers for them. Hi, my name's Maura Rouse, and I've been a member of this congregation for decades. And I stand here today to just acknowledge a milestone in my own life and my own family, which is that my younger of two children is graduating high school this week, and thank you for being my community and supporting me through so much. I'm Kate Sweetser. Um, so I had a few things, but the first was that Thursday night was great, and real big joy is that um, our eldest, Steve, um, had two big events at school. She got inducted into the National Junior Honor Society, which is very exciting, especially after the huge struggles last year. You know, we've, none of my kids have ever had any problems in school, which I feel really grateful for, and then the pandemic happened and the remote learning, and it was horrendous and I was like oh no have we hit that point where it's become too much for her or you know that she's just losing that focus no went to a new school this year when she started middle school and she is just blossoming and she is so happy and loves it so much and I hear that she's the exception you know right now um, and she also had her end of the year art show because she is in the art magnet at Burncoat um, at the Hanover program at Burncoat and it was just amazing to see all of these kids' artwork all over the walls and how proud they were and how much work they had put in this year. And I was just so excited for everyone. Um, and then I just have a hope is that, you know, we're sort of uh, looking to buy a new house. And we actually, we made an offer yesterday. We're just waiting. We're definitely like, if we get it, we get it. If we don't, we don't. That's fine. But um, I, we had made an offer a couple weeks ago and didn't get it, and that devastated me. So I feel like I'm in a better, in a, in a better mental place this time, because um, I really wanted that one. But um, yeah, so just keep lifting me up. <laughs> Thanks. Hi. My name is Ryan Wallace, and um, most of you here in the congregation know that for uh, quite a while, as I've told you before, my older brother is living over in Japan right now. He's a teacher over there that teaches um, middle school and elementary Japanese uh, students English. Well, I've been, it's no secret that I've been very much making plans to go and visit him over the summer, hopefully. However, I found that there's been a bit of a wrench in the plans. Um, recently, it was announced that the Japanese government is slowly allowing tourists to come back in but they have a few uh, requirements and stipulations about that. The first one being that, in or that you can't go in, um, by yourself and like, uh, just be a tourist over in Japan. You have to go with a guided group for that. That's like one of the biggest requirements that they have. And the second thing that I found out, which is gonna be even more of a headache, is that in the past, you could um, just normally take your passport, go over there, and um, as long as you, um, declared like where you'd be going and all that stuff, you'd be able to pretty much go around Japan without any too many restrictions. Well now, um, they are doing a huge thing where they are requiring a visa in order for you to actually be able to even travel around there even with the group. So it's, um, it's a headache that I'm going through right now, which means I may have to push my plans back for when I want to go and visit just because there's gonna be so much red tape that I'm gonna have to go through to even get these requirements set. So I'm hoping that maybe as the weeks go on and I, I can find out more that maybe Japan will release these, which will ease up on the restrictions a little bit more. So I'm just um, hoping for some good news in that. Good morning. 
This is from Facebook, from Karen Stevenson. She says, my joy is my mom has moved home and we are waiting to see if she has gone into remission. And also, congrats to the youth group seniors. Yeah, and uh, online we have from Mara Pentlarge, after 10 months on crutches, I can walk. I'm staying outdoors because masks are optional. So congratulations to her. From Bernadette Nelson, she's happy to report that my mom and husband, Brian, are feeling better from COVID-19. I continue with my recovery. Hopefully we'll be better for my surgery on June 23rd. From Tom Pierce, I'm visiting my niece and my brother in Virginia this week. And from Laura Lenahan, thinking this week of the Familia family this weekend, for yesterday was the one year anniversary of his drowning at Green Hill Park. Let us be in the spirit of prayer and meditation. Spirit of life, source of our inner and outermost being, we turn our thoughts this day to those who continue to strive for health and wholeness amidst the lingering impact and effects of pandemic and those for whom anniversaries have come and days of celebration have arrived and moments of success are acknowledged, as well as those moments when we are given the opportunity to say goodbye, to usher in both new life and to recognize the lives of those who have gone before us. We too acknowledge the, the strain and the stress of having come through a emergent time. And we wish that the world would be a more compassionate place. And so we commit ourselves to continue to build community where that compassion is alive and growing. Help us be mindful and heartful this day that the challenges we face need not be faced alone. That together we are stronger than we can ever imagine that we are here both to celebrate and to witness to possibilities and promises and places made more abundant by those who care. Help us to remember that in the days to come so that we might be able to come together again in ways that make for more peace more hope, and more love. Amen. And blessed be.
In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord sitting on a throne high and lofty. And the hem of his robe was filled, filled the temple. Seraphs were in attendance above him. Each had six wings. With two, they covered their faces. With two, they covered their feet. And with two, they flew. And one called to another, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole world is full of his glory. The pivots of the threshold shook at the voices of those who called, and the house filled with smoke. And I said, Woe is me, I am lost. For I am a man of unclean lips, and I am among a people of unclean lips. Yet my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. Then one of the seraphs flew to me, holding a live coal that had been taken from the altar with a pair of tongs. And the seraph touched my mouth with it and said, Now that this has touched your lips, your guilt has departed and your sin is blotted out. And then I heard a voice, voice of the Lord, saying, Whom shall I send and who will go for us? And I said, Here I am. Send me. These words from the sixth chapter of the book of Isaiah in the Hebrew Scriptures are a popular reading for services of ordination when newly minted ministers are formally recognized by a congregation as professional religious leaders. Words that chronicle the well-worn path to public service in religious institutions, a path that often begins with denial. No, not me. I am not the one, I am not ready for this journey, it can't possibly be me. The path that many people who are called into ministry will recall is replete with many moments when the call out of the great mystery of the universe and the human conscience seem relentless until the echo is too much to ignore and the moments of confirmation that one need heed to the cry too forthright to put aside. It's also a moment of blessing that recognizes both the glorious incompleteness of the one who's called and the power of the call itself to transcend one's utter humanness and call them anyway into a future which places their humanity in the path of service to that which is so much larger than themselves. It is both awesome and terrifying. I'm reminded here that the title of the sermon preached at my own ordination in 1991 was, It is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. This is the season for such ceremonies. And as I reflect on this, I'm aware that these ceremonies not only require the commitment of one who is called into ministry, but also the renewed commitment of communities that call such persons into an ongoing commitment to the covenant values, ministry, and mission out of which such calls come. And it is this commitment that occupies my thoughts this morning. In his book, The Prophetic Imperative, part of which we heard for our reading this morning, Gilbert continues, the term prophet has traditionally been referred to, to an individual. There were prophets of ancient Israel, a group of individuals living in the 8th through the 6th centuries before the Common Era. There are prophets of the human spirit, founders of great world religions and other pinnacle figures who shook the foundations of their time and ours. In a mass society of bureaucratized ethos, it is much more difficult to think of individual prophets. To be sure, there are individuals who tower over their times. Martin Luther King Jr., Mahatma Gandhi, Albert Schweitzer, Jane Addams, Susan B. Anthony, and Rachel Carson, to name a few. However, social change today requires much more 
than charismatic individuals. It requires the mobilization of individual energies into communal power. The prophetic church is a religious community that seeks to intervene in human society for the sake of social justice. The intervention is made in the context of religious conviction, but without the supernatural confidence of the Hebrew prophets. This is rather a tall spiritual order. The authority of the prophetic liberal church will instead be derived in somewhat more humanistic terms that articulate a transcendent standard for justice. As a transcendent matter, think, if you will, of the vision of Unitarian forebear Theodore Parker, who authored the words that are often attributed to Martin Luther King Jr. The moral arc of the universe is long, but it bends toward justice. Following the communal application of the concept of the prophetic, Gilbert frames the work of the church as imperative, which he notes emerges from the disciplines of freedom, saying, freedom is not merely the absence of restraint, but the will and the capacity to act on one's environment. It is a freedom that implies responsibility to engage and expand freedom in the social order Freedom, a central value of Unitarian Universalism, is a social concept, and it is to be preserved. An obligation is placed on the free person. He writes, I believe we are not free to desist from struggling for freedom for self and others. Freedom, by its very nature, places an imperative claim on the free person to expand freedom for all. That imperative comes with a sense of urgency for Gilbert, an urgency to live out the ethical implications of religious faith. Gilbert uses a typology of social concern authored by Thomas Price in 1973 as a means of discussion of different orientations toward the role of the individual in the community as they relate to social change. I want to suggest this morning that, that more than four types of orientation, what Pierce describes, Price describes, is a trajectory of social concern and witness that begins with service that brings one into direct contact with those who have been most marginalized by systems of oppression. Think, if you will, about the ministries here that provide such opportunities through service to the hungry and the homeless. Those who seek a place in community, those challenged by addiction recovery, or who continue to suffer from the isolation wrought by homophobia, economic inequality, sexual violence, voter suppression, and white supremacy. There are innumerable ways in which we have striven to serve and to companion other agencies and communities and individuals who share our commitment to alleviate suffering in its myriad forms. Those who have been touched by such efforts here are often energized to dig deeper into the causes such suffering breeds or is bred by, which leads to a second type of response, which is education. Referencing the story of the Good Samaritan in the Christian scriptures, my colleague notes, it's not enough to bind the wounds of the distressed traveler on the road to Jericho and to leave some money for his care. It is important that we begin to understand what happened and why. What are the social and moral conditions that create poverty in the midst of plenty? Education becomes a tool for social change when we deepen our understanding of social problems. We uncover the corruptions of power, greed, and irresponsibility. When we see the minimum wage lagging far behind the cost of living, we know there are powers that find it against their self-interest. We discover the poor pay a disproportionate part of their er discover the poor pay a disproportionate part of their earnings in taxes even as middle-class people moan and take as a matter of right their tax write-offs on homes and other entitlements. 
real social education, radical education, writes Gilbert. digs into the roots of our problems and reveals the pictures that are often unpleasant for those in power to view. And when the conscience is raised through the process, it often leads to a third of crisis types, which is social witness, the process of making public the convictions that arise from such processes. These, this is the process of speaking truth to power, if you will. Gilbert, in his book, uses the example of confronting policy made by the Department of Health and Human Services about the way in which, at a time when he was serving in Rochester, those who benefited from receiving food from cupboards and food pantries were told that they needed to report that on their income statements so that they might be appropriately taxed for food that receives from the community. It was at a time when I remember preaching in Marietta, Ohio, about the way in which we were auctioning off the poor to those agencies, including churches, who sought to purchase the capacity to serve them from the government. But that is not the only example of when churches have risen to the occasion. In this congregation, I want you to remember what it was like the years not that far ago when we as a congregation stood in opposition to the state's unwillingness to recognize civil marriage as a right. And I remember all too well declaring myself one of a handful of clergy in the Commonwealth who said, I'm not going to sign any marriage licenses for anyone until such time as I can sign them for same-sex couples. There was a lot of anxiety among us, including me, about that decision. Some openly suggested I was doing it because I simply wanted to marry my mother, which was a joke, but what was very much a part of my journey is the fact that after decades of marriage and my father's death, my mother, who was so very loyal and so very loving to the man who is the vision of ministry that I was raised with and who inspired me more than anyone else to do what I do and love so much, that woman had the courage to claim her own love, and four years after his death came out, worried most about what her grandchildren, who had not yet been born but was on the way, grandchild, was going to think about having three grandmothers. And I said, lucky? <laughs> it reminded her in the moment to not worry so much about labels, but to love. That same ethic was very much a part of the journey of this place. It's that same ethic that was a part of the process by which this congregation took up the food pantry that it now uses, that it now serves the neighborhood with. But it is more than an act of charity as the people who have become part of that process will remind you. Our own Diane Mann is sitting here and I'm mindful of the fact that Diane's servers service brought her into close contact with state regulators and commissioners who she decided to educate. But the formula that they were using in order to dictate how much could be allocated was wrong. And I love Diane for this, as well as so many other things. But her ability to be able to speak truth to power in that moment and witness to something that was just plain wrong was taken up by the state and changed. Had it not been for her experience in working with the, intimately with those people who needed our assistance, she would have never come into an awareness of just how wrong the system was on that point. 
and so many others here. I think about those who work with our homeless families and homeless individuals that have become aware of the way in which we often stand in opposition to people actually finding adequate and stable housing. How the markets that we operate by work against the possibility that people will actually be able to purchase homes. That the way in which we develop the properties in our community at market rates ends up marginalizing hundreds and hundreds of people in our community who those markets rely on in order to function, but who will never be able to afford to live in the very communities that they serve because of the way in which the market profits from their poverty. When we do these kinds of things of service, we end up becoming aware of, and more than that, energized to make real change in the world. Now, I have been accused over the years of conflating spirituality and social action, which I must say, from my standpoint, is bullshit. Because there is nothing more spiritual as far as I'm concerned. Nothing more meaning-making, if that is the frame in which I understand spirituality, than putting my body and my resources in service to a larger compassion and a larger justice. It does not conflate the two. It understands the intimate relationship between them. We need communities like this that help enliven us and make us aware of our passions, that gift us with the ability to be able to connect with others who may share those passions and to make those passions real in the world. And in the process, we must care for each other spiritually. We must make certain that we not walk alone through all of the trials and tribulations of our own existence, that our teachers understand that as difficult as it is in the classroom, they are never alone. That there will always be people to whom they can turn and who will buoy them up, for whom they can lean on, and who will remind them of their glorious worth, capacity, and service. We must do both. We must be a place that celebrates and honors and welcomes everyone who comes through the door, and a place that allows them the freedom to be able to choose the path in which their energies will make a difference in the world. That is the prophetic imperative at its finest. And I want to suggest today that it is, in fact, that to which we are called as a congregation. I want to find, if I can, in the text because I just lost the place of it. The parable that unites these two things is a parable that 22 years ago I used in a number of sermons here. And I think that memory is not that long, so it's a parable worth repeating. I want you to think about where you are in this story, who you are in this story. Once upon a time, there was a small village at the edge of a river. The people were good, and life was, was good. One day, a villager noticed a baby floating down the river. The villager quickly jumped into the river and swam out to save the baby from drowning. And the next day, the same villager was walking along the bank and noticed two babies in the water. They called for help, and both babies were rescued from the swift waters. And the following day, four babies were seen caught in the turbulence, and then eight, and then more, and then still more. 
for those of you who've been reading the newspaper, I want you to think about the mental health challenges of our children in relationship to this story. The villagers organized themselves quickly, setting up watchtowers and training teams and swimmers who could resist the waters and rescue the babies, and rescue squads were soon working 24 hours a day, and each day the number of the helpless babies floating down the river increased. The villagers organized themselves efficiently. The rescue squads were now snatching many children each day. Groups were trained to give mouth-to-mouth -mouth resuscitation. Others prepared formula and provided clothing. Many were involved in making the clothing and knitting blankets, and still others provided foster homes and placement. While not all the babies, now very numerous, could be saved, the villagers felt they were doing well to save as many as they could. Indeed, the village priest blessed them for their work, and life in the village continued on that basis. And one day, however, someone asked a question. Where are the babies coming from? Who is throwing them into the river? Why? Let's organize a team and go upstream to see who's doing it. The seeming logic of the elders countered, and if we go upstream, who will operate the rescue operations? We need everyone concerned right here. But don't you see, cried the lone voice, if we find out who's throwing them in, we can stop the problem and no babies will drown. By going upstream, we can eliminate the cause of the problem. It's too risky. And so the number of babies in the rivers increased daily. Those saved increased, but those who drowned increased even more. Beloved, we have to do both. We have to find ways to continue to serve those who are made most vulnerable in our community, and we need to welcome them into our midst as a part of our community. And we need to make certain we have the resources to travel as far upstream as necessary in order to be able to address the genesis of injustice and speak truth to power and make sure that change itself occurs. That is what we are called to do as a congregation. And in this era, our community and our commonwealth and our country is more needful of congregations of this sort than it has ever been in its history. We must meet the challenge of this day with all that we are and all that we have. That is a prophetic imperative. Amen. And blessed be. Would you please join in our litany this morning, which is... <clears throat> You have, you have a very difficult part. You have a response. And it's one line, and the response is, may we reach out in honesty and love. Can you say that with me? May we reach out in honesty and love. We are not isolated beings, but connected in mystery and miracle to the universe and to each other. Anonymous. In the spirit of love, harmony, and remembrance, we stand too often divided, too often set apart from one another in heedless ways. We seek to be compassionate, but our vision may be clouded or distracted. We too often go forward day by day and look without seeing. May we work to heal the divisions which separates Earth's children one from another, May we peer through the mists of deception which hide and deny violence, mists enclosing those who suffer. May we not allow the misuse of our fellow souls to hide in broad daylight. May we reach out in honesty and love. When we see the afflicted, however they may be afflicted, may we not shrink away. May we not blame suffering on the one who suffers. 
May we be courageous enough to perceive suffering and compassionate enough to attend to the voices of those who suffer. May we reach out. When we see prejudice, when we hear evil speaking, when we witness the rough hand of the scathing word laid upon the helpless or innocent, may we resolve to work toward unity and justice. May we reach out in honesty and love. May we not turn away from the wounded head of the abused. May we not accept the twisted reasoning by which the oppressor declares himself the victim. May we reach out in honesty and love. Let our gratitude for good fortune in our lives lead us not to complacency, but to awareness. Awareness of those whose lives are shadowed by abuse and neglect. May we not ignore signs of deceit nor denial that hide brutality. May we reach out in honesty and love. In all things, may those who suffer ever be able to approach us. Find a kindly ear and supporting hand. May we witness for love and just justice at every level of relationship. May we nurture a keen eye and strong, loving heart for any who fear the hurtful rod, the cutting voice, the uneven hand, the chain of oppression, great or small. May, May we, we reach, reach out, out in honesty and love. Would you please join together in our closing hymn number 103, For All the Saints. Please rise in body or in spirit. For all the saints who from their labors rest, who confessed thy name most holy be forever blessed alleluia alleluia thou wast their rock their shelter and their might their strength and song in the well-fought fight Thou in the darkness Deep their one true light Alleluia Alleluia A blessed communion Of the saints divine We shine, yet all are one new and whole and thine, alleluia, alleluia. And when the strife is fierce, the conflict long steals on me distant triumph song. All hearts are brave, again and arms are strong. Alleluia, alleluia. Words of my friend and colleague Tom Shade, once minister of First Unitarian Church Worcester. My friends, there is a power at work in the universe. It works through human hands. But it was not made by human hands. It's a creative, sustaining, and transforming power, and we can trust that power with our lives and our ministries. It will sustain us wherever we take it, a stand on the side of love. Whenever we take a stand for peace and justice, Whenever we take a risk, trust that power. We are together held 
by that power. Amen. And blessed be. Thank you, Deb, for your music this morning. Once again, beloved, worship in this place has come to an end, but our service continues next with a brief fellowship hour um, with a return in about 15 minutes back to the sanctuary for our annual congregational meeting. Um, so please do go find a refreshment and make use of the facilities as you desire and then return here at 1145 so that we can conduct the business of the congregation.